Good afternoon, everybody, and I hope you're okay in what have become some very, very difficult restrictions being placed upon us. And I know that many of you will be very disappointed that you can't do what you wanted to do with your family this Christmas. Um, it's very, very sad. But this pandemic is unprecedented. We don't know where it's going. And so it's not fair to be blaming governments or anything about it. Uh, everybody's doing the best they can to make sure that we're all safe. And I want to reiterate that when you come to Mass at Christmas Day or Christmas Eve, you will be safe. Uh, many people have got their tickets to come. There are some places left, so you can ring the Priory if you want to. Just be sure of having a place. Um, we spread the three masses, the masses out on Christmas Eve, which has made a big difference. So we won't have 400 people here at once. But those people will be here and they'll be able to hopefully celebrate Christmas together and worthily. And that's a great thing. So the, just to remind you that there's mass on Christmas Eve here at 12 o'clock, which will be the televised mass. Three o'clock in the afternoon, seven o'clock in the evening and midnight, literally at midnight and then on Christmas morning at 8 and 10. The Mass is in Market Bosworth, and we're at 9 o'clock on Christmas morning, and then there'll be Mass at um, 6 o'clock on Christmas Eve in Old Shilton, and 10.30 in the morning. After which, some of us, if you so wish, are going to go and say a prayer at Father Terry's grave. So I hope it all works out, and I hope we can have a prayerful, reflective time and that's what we've been trying to think about these last two or three weeks. It's not easy for me to explain all these things to you in the pulpit because it takes time and it takes a bit of you know, listening and so on. So you're looking at all this stuff next to me, uh, that is Greek. And you say, well, it's all Greek to me. Yes, so I'm about to explain why it's important. So what we've been doing is we've been looking at the biblical texts around our Lord's birth, which we sometimes call the infancy narratives. And we've concentrated our energy on St. Matthew and St. Luke because there are no stories of our Lord's birth in St. Mark. And we've talked about the similarities between them, how they echoed the Old Testament on purpose to show that the, the Old Testament texts were being fulfilled in the person of Jesus and how the event of his birth actually happened, as St. Luke points out to us. Today, then, we're going to look at St. John, which is entirely different. The first thing is, St. John's Gospel was written maybe 20 years after the others, and that 20 years was quite important. When Luke and Matthew put their accounts together, people had come to believe that Jesus was the promised Messiah he was, in his own words, the son of man. And so that's reflected in their uh, accounts. 20 years later, the church had come to realize that Jesus was not simply the promised Messiah, but he was in fact the son of God who had been there for all time. And that is what is expressed in John's account of his birth. There is no stable. There is no Mary and Joseph, no shepherds, no kings, no nothing. Um, Our Lady appears in St. John's Gospel only twice. And when she does, it's rather peculiar circumstances. She is present at the first event of Jesus' ministry, the marriage at Cana. And she says to her son, they have no wine like any mother would. And he uses a very strange expression. He said, he calls her woman. Woman, what is that to me? Sounds a bit disrespectful. But in that expression, he is separating himself from his mother so that he can carry out his ministry. And when his ministry comes to the end, when he's on the cross, that's the second time she appears next to St. John. And he says to her, woman, this is your son, son, this is your mother. So it's almost as if Jesus' ministry in St. John's Gospel is bracketed around the person of his mother at the beginning and the end, but he doesn't appear in the middle. 
And so what we have here is a highly worked over account of Jesus' birth, which is not one big domestic like the others. And St. John had come to realise that Jesus was Almighty God, the same God that was there at the very beginning of time. And that's why he begins his account um, using the same words as are used at the beginning of the book of Genesis, which is a Hebrew word, Bereshith, which is that word which means in the beginning. Now in Hebrew, the word for word is davar. They, they pronounce a B as V in Hebrew, davar. And not only does it mean word, but it's much more dynamic. It means an event, a happening. So when we say in Hebrew that Jesus is the word of God, he is the, the happening of God, the event of God, the person of God. Which, you know, makes you think when at the end of each reading at Mass we hear, this is the word of the Lord. Um, you know, what that actually means is this is the person of the Lord. And when God speaks, something happens. So when creation happened in that first chapter in the book of Genesis, the first account of tree, which is the, the, the newer one, a very philosophical account of creation, God said, let there be light, and there was light. And so in God's speaking, something happens. And, and throughout that account in Genesis 1, he says, let there, be, let there be light and dark, let there be so on. And when he speaks, something happens. The word and the event are the same thing. Which brings us then to St. John's Gospel. It's the beginning of St. John's Gospel, the story of Jesus' birth. Now, in order to understand this, we have to think, first of all, about what we call tenses. In English, there are three past tenses. The perfect, the imperfect, and the pluperfect. I'm sure you all know. So, I did something or I have done something, a past tense, is the perfect tense. Um, yesterday, I uh, have decorated, I have decorated my house yesterday. Um, or I decorated my house yesterday. The pluperfect is I had done something, which looks even further back. Um, I had been there many times, but this time was different. So that's what they call the pluperfect tense. And the imperfect tense is about what you were doing a, a lot, for a long time. So I was living in the Outer Hebrides for 10 years. I was. So that was is an imperfect tense which denotes a continuous activity. Now, just to make life difficult, in Greek, there is an extra tense called the aorist tense. And it splits up what we understand by the perfect tense. So, in Greek, the perfect tense is, I have done something. But when you say, I did something, that is the aorist tense. Bang, I did something. It's a very definite thing which we will come to in a minute. So, this brings us to our bit of Greek here. I'm sorry about my awful writing. En arche en ho logos, kai ho logos en pros ton theon, kai theos en ho logos. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. Okay, right. That word, en, en, as it's called, is the imperfect of the verb to be. So, in the beginning was the word. The word was all the time. It continued to be. It was a continuous thing. And the word was with God. And the word was God. So, that use of that tense is telling us that God was there from all time and that the word was with him and was him. The event of God was with him. 
which is Jesus, of course. And then the, the, the uh, prologue, as it's called, goes on. It talks about he was in the world that knew his be that had its being through him, but the world did not know him. He came to his own people, but his own people did not accept him. And that's what's called the history of salvation. It talks about how God was in the world throughout time, throughout time. And he was offering himself, he was giving himself throughout, and that's what we call salvation history, and his people rejected him. Which brings us then to this sentence. Kai halogos sarx egenita. Kai eskenosen enhumin. And the word became flesh, and that literally, eskenosen, usually means tabernacled. He tabernacled himself in us, human is us. Amen is us, sorry. Amen is us. And, and so the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now that is the aorist tense. And that means that after all this activity of God being in the world and so on, at one moment, this word became a human being. One moment. Having been present, having been there through the events of the history of the people of Israel, those events that took place were words of God, but they didn't understand them. So at one moment, at one moment, the word became flesh. We used to say, which was wrong, even in the creed, because of the Latin translation, et verbum caro factus est, and the word was made flesh. The word was not made flesh, because you're made flesh by somebody else. The word became flesh. I know they, in the translation of the creed now we have that, which is right. The word became flesh. At one moment, the word kai halogos sart flesh became. And so what St. John is showing us, it's a, if you like, a cosmic picture about how God was with his people throughout time and how he was with them, but they didn't know, they didn't recognize him or they turned away. So at one moment, he became flesh. He, he entered our world finally and thereby transformed the world in which we live. And so this is a theological meditation on the birth of Christ. And when we use the word incarnation, um, that's what we mean. It's, it's Jesus incarnate taking flesh, becoming one of us, entering human history at a particular time and thereby changing that history. So from that time of the birth of Jesus, we can never say that God is absent. He is present in everything even in the things that we don't necessarily think he should be present in. So moving away from this domestic picture of Christmas, you have this theological understanding in the Greek text about how God, the word was with God and was God throughout time and at one particular moment entered human history. That is effectively the theological understanding of the birth of Jesus and how it has changed everything. In St. John's theology, the events that um, take place, there are no miracles in St. John's gospel. He calls them signs. That's a different word. They're not miracles, they're signs. And they are signs of the power of God breaking out into the human situation. And there are seven of them, beginning with the marriage at Cana um, and ending with the raising of Lazarus. And in uh, biblical thinking seven is a magic number I see God made the world in seven days and um, the seventh is what encapsulates the rest so if you like a, a sort of diving metaphor the uh, degree of difficulty <laughs> increased as he went along so he you know changed water into wine and um, then you know, cured a man at the sheep pool 
then he cured a deaf man, and then he gave sight to a blind man, and then he raised Lazarus from the dead. So, in John's thinking, this prologue, as it's called, sets the scene for this almighty God who was, from the very beginning, breaking into human history. And the events that take place are the sign of God's working among us. And that is an entirely different theological understanding. And since that time, we've meditated on this. We've tried to put this faith into different concepts, different words, but we're still saying the very same thing. So I'd like to read you something, which is a version of St. John's prologue that was written in 2010. Written in 2010. And this was put to music. And you will recognize it as being one of the opening pieces of the musical Mother Mary. But this is not an accident. It's not just putting funny words to Abba's songs. This is expressing that truth in a modern setting. But it's the same truth. So, in the very beginning God lived on his own with no friends to call his family. He felt so lonely and very sad and thought he'd made a world with all the love he had. He spoke, it came to be. He made the sky and seas, the plants and trees, the moon and stars and you and me. It was not too long before his friends rejected him and turned to their own needs and ends forgot his love and his care for them, lived for themselves and for what they could just gain and get. Each time they turned away and always spurned his love, stopped listening to his voice so true come from above. He sent them warnings down through the years, his word ignored, and it fell too soon on their deaf ears. The prophets, kings and angels came, they took no notice or heed, and then confirmed his fears. When nothing could be done, at last he sent his son, his life, his love, his very self, the only one. And then the chorus is, don't reject me, I'm your father. Come back with all your heart. Turn to me again. I love you. We'll make a brand new start. So those words written ten years ago for a musical are exactly the same as this Greek text which we are familiar with in its English translation on the morning mass of Christmas Day. The meaning of Christmas, the meaning of Jesus' birth is not simply a polite little story of sentiment. It's interesting that in some translations of St. Luke, the, the word, there's another word for word in Greek, it's called tokrema, and um, in some translations, the theology of St. Luke prefigured what he had. So the shepherds say, um, let us go to Jerusalem to see this thing that has happened that the Lord has made known to us. And in some translations, it's translated as tokrema tuto, which means this word, let us see this word that has happened that the Lord has made known to us. So in a way that sort of thinking was present in Luke and Matthew before it was formalized theologically in St. John's Gospel. And the last thing is that these, this prologue is what's called one of the hymns of the New Testament. And hymns are ways in which we express our faith. 
And as I said last week, that we were talking about what we call the oral tradition, that there were hymns that were said or sung, and those hymns expressed faith. And so this, when you read it in the translation, a brilliant translation, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Without him, nothing came to be. Everything that had its being came through him. And so it's, it's, it's poetic. It's poetic. And when we sing our carols, or sadly this year, listen to our carols, um, some of them we sort of bang out. But actually, those carols are ways of expressing our faith in the same truth. And uh, I'm sure you'll all have your favourite carol. My favourite carol is called um, O Little Town of Bethlehem. And in the midst of that, there's this beautiful verse how silently how silently the wondrous gift is given so God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven no ear can hear his coming yet in this world of sin where meek souls will receive him still the dear Christ enters in. My prayer for you, dear friends, on this very difficult Christmas celebration is that the dear Christ will enter into the hearts and souls of each of us to give us hope to give us comfort, and yes, to give us joy. A very happy Christmas to all of you.